All right, so uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, I'm Lauren, I'm the instructor for this workshop. Um, I've been working with R for, uh, like I said in the Slack, coming up on a decade. And um, I've been, this is my second year teaching this workshop. And I also TA'd for Boris Stipe when he taught it uh, before me. So I'm really excited to be continuing on uh, teaching a new generation of R users here. Um, and I'm excited to get started. So without further ado, I think we're ready to go. Um, so one thing is this is uh, under a Creative Commons license. So if you attribute um, to us, you can share and remix these slides and use them yourselves. Um, and we encourage you to do so. Um, so my goal for this workshop um, is that you all will be able to read any data, uh, all of your data into R um, and you'll know how to do so. You'll be able to inspect it within the R environment um, using functions like structure, dimension, length, view. Um, you'll be able to conduct basic statistical analysis or even find the statistical analysis you'd like to do um, and do that. Um, and more fearlessly debug your errors you find in your R script. So when you get an error message, I don't want you to um, break out into a cold sweat quite so quickly. Um, maybe you, you'll be able to cool your nerves and find your way through uh, more easily. Um, and then create and modify publication quality R plots. So I know um, as someone who I also use Python or um, you know, basic uh, like Linux command line, other programming software, nothing I don't think quite approaches R's uh, plotting capabilities. So I'm really excited to share that capability with you. And um, I hope that you'll be able to use it yourself for publications. Um, and then for you to seek out and use R packages. So uh, there's a huge diversity of um, specialties of people attending this workshop. And even myself, I've used R for many different things. And there's a massive um, kind of uh, trove of R packages out there that allow you to do so many different things with your R uh, environment and, and to you know uh, visualize your data, analyze your data, all kinds of things. So. Um, I'd like to um, kind of sh give you a peek into that world and make it so that you yourself can go find what will work best for your data and your analyses, um, and then you can go use those. Um, and then I really wanted to um, pay homage to Ellen Vanderplas. So years ago, we created an R workshop that many of these slides are based on. Um, and so I think uh, it's important to say she's at University of Iowa now, but she's also herself giving R workshops out there that are quite similar to these slides. Um, oh, you know what? I had this in the last one, but I think, uh, what do you guys think about doing this this year, uh, Francis and Rashad, of having just notes like uh, that we all share here um, for the R workshop? Um, or should we just leave it to the Slack? I, uh, I think, so is there a specific type of note that you were needing no, to see these there? Were just, these are just uh, a Google Doc. So we could just yeah, share I understand. a Google Doc. Yeah, yeah. But uh, let me, uh, I mean, I, So we'll put this I, on I think, ice. Yeah, let's put it on ice, but let's think about it maybe at the first break. And yeah. uh, so the issue, so one issue is that this Google Doc would be more permanent than the Slack uh, chatter. So Slack yeah. chatter so uh, does, yeah. doesn't last forever and so forth. Mm -hmm. So this might be a good idea. So let okay, us uh, so set we'll that up while you, you go on. And then I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in the Slack for that. Perfect. So sorry about that, guys. I will update this, actually. Um, and I think for this first uh, section, be fine without, but we'll link to one um, so we can all be sharing notes. Um, and we found in the past this is actually really helpful to um, kind of just compile lots of user guided notes um, through this workshop as we go. So uh, this link will be updated. So some tips for further reading. You know, the World Wide Web, R is um, open, it's free. And because of that, many, many people are contributing to essentially help guides all throughout the internet. Um, including workshops, courses, um, so additional ones you can find online, ones that are specialized to uh, how you're actually using your data and analyzing it. So I really encourage you to really just, you know, use Google 
um, to find your solutions. Um, most often you'll find if you're encountering an issue, someone else has encountered a similar issue before and they've published the result online. So um, I really encourage you to take advantage of that. But if you're someone who wants a little bit more um, of an analog uh, kind of user guide, uh, this book is outstanding. Um, I'm not uh, paid by them or anything, but Andy Field is hilarious. Um, and I think he makes um, analysis really accessible via R um, in discovering statistics using R. So this book, I can't recommend it enough, really. So why R? You know, uh, why are we teaching this whole workshop um, on this one software? Well, number one, it's free. And so it really makes science accessible from that perspective. You can analyze your data. And like I said, because of that, there's such a massive user base um, and a base of contributor contributors to R via packages um, that it's a super uh, diverse and flexible environment for you to work in. Um, yeah. And that's just repeating what I said. Whatever your problem is, in all likelihood, someone else has solved it and published their code. Um, and basic R software can be expanded with packages, uh, which makes the functionality really limitless. Um, and R Studio, which uh, you've been told to install as well, it provides a really user-friendly graphical interface, um, which will get used to working within. Um, and it makes R, the base R, uh, much more easy to work with and organize all of your code and output within. So let's, without further ado, go to the R environment. The first time you open up our studio, you'll see something like this. So when you've had a fresh installation, um, this is kind of what you're gonna be seeing. So you'll have the console pane and you'll know it's a console because it says it right here, console. Um, and this is where your code runs. So you'll see your code and then you'll see the output of that code all in this pane here. There's also an environment pane here. So it's got environment, history, connections, this tells you the variables you've defined and all the code you've run. Okay, that'll become more concrete as we go. And finally down here, files, plots, packages, and help. Uh, this shows your computer's files. So in this files pane, in this files tab here, um, the plots you generate, they'll come out on this window here um, and you'll be able to export them to files, copy and paste them from here, um, zoom into them if you'd like, um, and then uh, also help uh, so you can actually get help documentation um, from this paint. So let's get started. Your first script, oh, somehow I thought I updated the date on this one and it uh, regressed for me. So that'll also be updated. Sorry, folks. Um, and so here, the first script we're going to be working on is actually the script that you used to get started. Um, so to do your pre-work. So we're going to break that down and, and really dissect what you ran. Uh, to get started for this. So by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to set your working directory. You'll be able to read a CSV that stands for comma separated value uh, file into R. Um, you'll be able to create a grouping variable like a factor in R, and you'll be able to create and modify publication quality R plots. Okay, so starting your first script here, you're gonna go open file, um, intro to R pre-work, all of you will have done this to do your pre-work and then you'll have this new pane open up right here. Okay, and so this is the um, pre-work script that you guys were sent uh, to work on. Um, and this is in the script pane. So this is where you write your code, okay? And essentially this pane is actually just holding a text file here. So this script, um, these .r files, are actually, they're just text. And what the purpose for having the text is to really just document all the code you're writing so that you can run it down in the console pane. Um, but you really just wanna keep a record and that's what the text here does. So this is your script. All right, so once everyone has this um, all set up, you've got our studio open, you've got your script open here, um, go ahead and click yes. Um, and we'll move forward once everybody's uh, clicked yes. And click no if you're having issues getting to that point too. All right, we got a lot of people. Great. Okay. Um, so for the person who clicked no, uh, do you mind opening your mic or um, maybe 
speaking up on the Slack. Sorry, I'm actually going to get to my Slack window here. Um, I can. Sorry. Yeah. Go great. ahead. I just, yeah. I just I just have the because I ran it yesterday as preparation yeah. for today, and I have the previous version already on the mm -hmm. on that screen, and where I deleted the set W. Um, okay, line. that's okay. Fine. Okay, that's okay. fine. That's, that's but otherwise, idea. you have a script here. Yeah, 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 for sure. Great. So you're good to go. Good deal. Okay. Sure. You think myself. Perfect. All right. One sec. Now I have to get my thing up. There we go. Okay. I think we're good to go. Wonderful. All right. So you've got your script open. We're going to go line by line through the script now. All right. So um, first, I'm going to dash through all the lines and then we're going to break them down. So the first line is these are the packages we're using in the workshop. There's going to be a few more that you'll install uh, down the line, um, but you'll be so familiar with packages at that point that you'll be able to do it on your own. No problem. Uh, the next line is setting your working directory. So it's good to save this actually as a line in your code because it's directing where the data sits and uh, where you're writing your data to. So we will get that set up for everyone here. The next line is reading in your data. So notice that there's no file path beyond just the name of the data file. If you wrote the entire path to the data, um, then you actually don't need to set your working directory. But unless you are in um, kind of a, a directory, like your base directory, um, this is going to look in your working directory for this file. R is going to look in your working directory. Here, we're encoding a grouping variable. Um, here, we're now using the ggplot uh, package uh, that we installed here. Um, we're actually going to use it for uh, a graph. And here we're plotting a box plot of biomarker versus exposure group using ggplot. Uh, so using a function from the ggplot package. Okay, so now let's get started. Packages we'll use in this workshop. So installing packages. Um, packages, they're just collections of R functions. Um, and packages uh, can be created by anyone. Um, and then they're submitted to CRAN, um, so the central uh, kind of R uh, group. And uh, in your uh, environment history pane, you can actually click on packages. And you can see these are all installed packages um, on your machine. And so what happens when you install a package is it comes from the internet and it's loaded onto your computer. So it's saved in a file on your computer uh, locally. And that's it. That's all that means. Um, and so it just means that those functions are accessible. So to install packages, you can use the install.packages function, which is what is written in your script. Um, and you always want to have quotes around the name of the package uh, when you're installing it. So you only need to install a package once, but you need to reference it each time you use it. So that's why we have this library ggplot2. So installing a package takes it from the internet onto your computer, but library takes it from the computer into your R environment. Similar to kind of reading in data, this brings the functions from that package into your local R environment for you to use, okay? So you don't have to programmatically install packages. And when I say that, I mean, you don't have to use install.packages uh, to actually install them. You can also just use this install button um, on this pane here. So when you have your packages um, and then it will um, open up a pane that allows you to just type in the name of the package and you'll notice it'll be auto completing those packages as well. So I'm just going to go to my R window here and do a quick demo of this. When you have lots and lots of scripts, you also have them here in little tabs. All right. But I'm here on this tab. And if I go to my packages, I can change the size of these different panes uh, by just clicking on this middle here. And when this comes up, I can go to packages and I can install. Um, and then here, ggplot2, um, it will give me options for what I can install as well. So that's another option. And you know, you don't really need to be saving it. Like, we, like I said before, um, you know, this script is a log of what you've done because you only install packages one time, you don't actually need to have it saved in your script um, because you don't need to run it every single time. Um, so that's why even doing a point and click version of installing your packages should be totally fine. Okay, all right. Um, so here, 
uh, we see we installed packages ggplot2. ggplot2 should be in this packages pane. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's a way to just confirm that it's there. But nonetheless, you'll still need to library it in uh, to use it, okay? Next, we want to set a path uh, to our data. Um, so we do that using set working directory here, or set wd. Um, so uh, there's two options to go about this. One is programmatically doing it, um, as I'm showing here. So set wd um, here. This is common in um, uh, on Microsoft, uh, like a, a desktop computer. Here uh, you'll have Sampana. yeah. Sorry. Oh. Make sure. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, often uh, on a Windows or a PC, you'll have a drive that you're specifying. Um, but if you're on uh, Linux or a Mac, you'll often start with a tilde uh, to be setting your path. OK. So here you can type your path into your script. And if you start to write the path, you can press tab to actually um, show the available files and folders um, to be setting your path. So I'll just show you here. This is not the right path on this computer. So what I can do here is I can say, okay, I know I'm in the C drive. I can press tab here and I'm at users. So there, I just typed U and it updated my options here. So I'm gonna click U, okay. Um, then I'm going to push tab again. So whoops, make sure my cursor is here. Um, after that forward slash, press tab again. And I want to go to Lauren Erdman. I want to press tab. I know it's in teaching. Oops, no, I'm on desktop here. Desktop, teaching, and then CBW, and then intro to R. Let's see. Okay. And then I would do command or control enter. Here. Okay, so that's skipping ahead a little bit. So once you have your path written, if you're on a um, Windows or a Linux machine, you'll have Control Enter. But if you have a Command button, you'll be Command Enter to run that line of code. Okay, so I just want to show you guys again here. I just have my cursor anywhere on this line. And what I did was Control Enter. And you'll see it ran down here. I just want to see there's a Okay, there we go. Um, control enter one second. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so you'll see down here your code ran. Sorry, guys, I'm just making sure I'm caught up on the slack. Okay. Now, there's another option actually for setting your working directory. So if you don't want to go through searching tab, 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 and it's easier to do it from a file explorer uh, kind of perspective, then you can do this. You can do a, a kind of point and click version. So you can go session, set working directory, choose directory. That's going to open up a file explorer. And then here you see I'm choosing this workshops 2020 directory. And once I select that directory, again, it runs it down here. So it actually, that point and click version, it's still running that line of code, okay? And I wanna just go back here. So I actually have lots of files in this folder, but it's not showing any files because a working directory is a folder. So you wanna look for a folder. And once you're in that folder, then you say open, and then that sets your working directory, okay? So once you do that, it will run it. As I said before, it'll show up down here. It's also going to show up in your history tab because that means that line of code ran. So you also will have that line of code documented in history of your uh, R, R Studio. Um, and so what you can do is you can actually insert this. If you click on this line of code and you actually have selected this already, so first, I think the order of operations is select here, click here on your history tab. And then if you click to source here, it will actually update it over in your source. And so this is another way to save your working directory um, in your script 
without having to manually have typed that whole directory out. Um, and so once that's there and that has run, you can also see it down here. And this is where you know your working directory is. This is how you know what R is pointing to um, is right above your console pane here, okay? So once you set your working directory and you have the directory that you want to be, um, so it, it's got the example data one in it, um, go ahead and click yes once you have this working directory set in any way uh, you'd like, point and click, autocomplete, however you'd like to run it. Um, once it has run um, and you have the correct directory in your script, uh, click yes. Oops, sorry guys. Awesome. Good. And go ahead and click no too if you're having issues or open up your mic. It's no problem. All right. Good, we're getting a few more. Okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Okay, it looks like we're good. So now you've set your working directory. This is a very important step. Now you can import your data into the R environment because you're pointing to that data now uh, from your R environment. You can just run this line of code. Um, so I'm going to go back to this, um, but if you want to, you can just have your cursor anywhere on this line. And again, control enter, it will read that data into R. So let's talk about this data. Um, R can read in all kinds of data, uh, uh, data types. So it can read comma separated values, text files, Excel, LibreOffice. Um, it can read in any text file actually that um, uh, if you have any like genomic data or anything saved in a text file, even if the, the, um, uh, it doesn't say .txt at the end of it, if it's .bim, .bam, uh, .sam, um, et cetera, like it will read it in just fine. Um, and if there are like Excel files or anything, sometimes it just needs an extra package to read it in. So one very R friendly format is a comma separated value .csv. Um, this is how it would look in Excel. So if you open a CSV file in Excel, it's a nice kind of like spreadsheet format, very simple to read. But how it looks in Notepad and how it's encoded on the computer is uh, by commas. Uh, and so that's why it's called a comma separated value. We have on our first line, um, these are our header. Uh, this is our header line here. So um, as you can see, uh, my first column is sample ID. I've named it sample ID. My next column is exposure. Um, I've named it exposure, and then I have biomarker values here in this third uh, column, okay? And these are all separated by commas with a new line, so uh, kind of like enter, representing that a new line is created, okay? So here we have our name of our file in quotes. We have our read.csv uh, is our function that's actually helping us to read in this um, file. And we set header equals true there because we have headers on each of those um, columns. So if we set header equals false, uh, then R will say, okay, great, the entire file is data. I'm not gonna say that this first, uh, this first row here is a, um, uh, is a title to each column. So it won't treat it like that. So we have header equals true, of course, because we have headers. And then as is equals true makes it so that any um, text, uh, so anything that is a character string, not a number, then that is going to be treated just as a character string. It's not going to be made into some kind of a variable. One second. Okay. So just make sure you mute yourself. 
Right. Let me see if I can turn off people's microphones. Great. Okay. All righty. So, one sec. Just a brief intro. So here, I just dropped a lot of jargon, you know, functions, options here, arguments. Um, we're going to jump into these now. So commands, functions, objects in R. So commands, it's what you want R to do. So it's a full line. You're commanding R to do a thing. Um, here, we had a command. We said set working directory. That was telling R uh, to do a thing. It requires a function. Here, set WD is our function. And our argument to it is the working directory path that we set. They can also define objects. So we can have an object being made from a function working with some arguments here, okay? So an object is anything you create in R and you can see what objects exist in your R environment here. So I have run lots of things and that's why my environment um, is filled with so many objects. So these are all kinds of objects I've created in R, okay? Um, so yours should be relatively empty um, unless you've run some of these lines, in which case maybe you have DF um, here, for example. So these are objects. You've created them in R. It's a, it could be a single value, a matrix, a list of values, a statistical model. It could be a function. It could be all kinds of things, but you've just created them in your R environment. So a function is what you use to do in R to create your objects and your output. So functions, they're transforming things, um, some objects to other objects or plots, for example. So here, this is a silly example, but let's say we wanna create an object called ducktails, okay? This is our variable. And um, I'm gonna make that using this equal sign. I can also use an arrow, um, which uh, I'll show you later. Um, and here, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna make it by concatenating Uncle Scrooge in quotes, so this character string here, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, okay? So that's our object we're creating. We use the function concatenate, and we open the function here, we close it here. So functions need to have open and closing parentheses. And then these are our list of arguments that we send to this concatenate function. So we're saying concatenate these all in a vector. Okay, and so here we create a vector that's DuckTales, our object, and it's a vector of these names. If we want to now concatenate something additionally onto DuckTales, we can say, let's create a new object. We call it DuckTales Expand. And here we concatenate DuckTales with Donald Duck, and it creates a new um, object that is an expanded vector, okay? So no, there's no spaces between the function name and the parentheses you're opening here, all right? So you write the name of your function, like here, set WD, open parentheses, here, C, open parentheses. You'll see um, over here, we have read.csv, open parentheses. You don't want a space here, but you also want to close your parentheses here. What's nice is our studio is actually highlighting the parentheses that uh, corresponds to the one that your cursor is on. So you'll know if you've cro closed your parentheses. But R won't consider you finished with your functional command until it sees the end parentheses there. So it's very important that you're closing up all of those commands. That's a very common error, okay? So first, I just wanna quickly review what I just said. So let's say, because this is a common error, let's say you didn't have this here. So here, um, a lot of X's are gonna be created because it's looking for that closed parenthesis. Also, if you run this line, you'll be getting this plus sign down here, okay? So it's a little bit hard to see. And so see here, I ran it. I don't have this closed parenthesis. It's looking for that closed parenthesis somewhere. So there's two things you can do when you start to get these plus signs. Notice I'm like trying to get out of it, enter, enter, enter. It's still there. The plus sign's still there. R really wants you to close up that statement. Two options I can do to get rid of this. One, I know that it's missing a parenthesis here. So I could just do shift and close that parenthesis and then run it. Great. It ran the line. It's happy with it. It got the data in and it's correct. Okay. 
So that's one option. Okay, so just to reiterate, I ran this line, I have lots of space, and then I just closed up my statement and it didn't give me a plus sign anymore. So it gave me this carrot here. It tells me I'm good to go, I can keep running code. Another option though, if you find yourself in this situation, so I'm gonna do this again, I'm gonna get myself in the same situation. I've got this plus sign. And let's say I'm like, now I'm trying to run dim DF. Oh, wait, what? No, oh no, here we go. Sorry, it didn't give me the error I expected. Um, dim, it's giving me errors. So here it's erroring, erroring out and it's letting me start a new line. Sometimes it won't let you do that. Sometimes you'll run it and you'll keep trying to get out of it. Another way to get out of it is just use your escape key at this point. So just escape, that will also get you out of it. So either create an error for yourself, escape or close your statement with your parentheses and just run the line accurately, okay? Those are the options to get out of this situation, all right? And certainly you'll find yourself in that situation again. I do myself, um, but just so you guys know. All right, so now <clears throat> let's go more deeply into these vectors. We're gonna see data frames and lists in R, okay? So vectors, they're one-dimensional objects. So like you saw before, we had Huey, Dewey, and Louie, um, and Donald Duck. We had them all concatenated together. That's one dimension. So it's just a, a long line of characters that we've strung together. So here I'm making another one, my vec, and I make it using concatenate, and I say cat, dog, fish, hamster, parrot, okay? If I wanna access, so I've created this, and I wanna access the second element, then I say my vec two, the result is dog. And it should end quotes there, okay? So here, let's just, I'm gonna make a vector here, my vec equals C, um, A, comma, B, comma, C. Notice I'm putting spaces here. I don't have to, these spaces are not essential, okay? Um, but the space after this function is, okay? I run this, I've created a new object here. So my vec, it will show up here. My vec is in values. Um, and when I say here, I wanna access the second element. Here, the second element of this is B. So I could do my vec and I can do square brackets two and here I'm getting B, right? So similarly to here where I'm accessing the second element, I'm getting dog. I could have accessed the first element by changing that two to a one and I get A, okay? So vectors are one dimensional and you can access each of the elements using the square brackets and then putting uh, the position of the thing you'd like to access, okay? Data frames, they're two dimensional. And um, if you think about the data that we're reading in here, it's a data frame. We're bringing it in as a data frame. Um, so a data frame, it will have different columns. They're all the same number of rows, right? So it's, it's all like a spreadsheet essentially. And this is what your data usually is formatted like. So here you can also, you can read it in like we just did. We create a data frame when we use read.csv, okay? Um, so here DF, this is a data frame that we've created. Um, but we can also create a data frame using the data frame function, okay? So here I use the data frame function. I'm saying my header, uh, my first header is header name one, and I assign that header name one to have my vec one as that column. And then I'm gonna have a second column. I'm gonna call it header name two. So that's my second header's name. And I'm gonna have my vec two be the second column. So here's my vec two. I've defined it up there and I'm using it down here. My vec one, I defined it up here. I'm using it down here. What this is gonna create is essentially like um, what we have in our data right now is um, a data frame that has two headers, header name one, header name two. And then it has the first vector as the column contents here and the second vector as the second columns contents, okay? So the column names though are also a vector. So you could use call names or names to access the column names. So here we've read in DF, we could say names df and we access the names. These are the column names, okay? 
So DF, if we want to just see it, you can just type it in and see it down here. Notice I'm in the console pane. I'm just typing them in and pushing enter. Um, and we can see this is also a data frame. But instead of here, where our header name one and header name two are our header names, here our header names are this weird umlaut sample ID, um, exposure, and buyer marker value. So these are our header names. And then these are the vectors, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, F. Um, are, are the sample ID names, um, exposure names, biomarker value names. These are vectors that are our columns in our data frame. Is there a question? I truly ask any questions if you're, if you're encountering them. I'm happy to answer them on, uh, if you wanna open up your mic or on the Slack is just fine. Okay. To access column one, you can use the dollar sign. So my DF header name one will give me the contents of my VEC one here. So this first column. So here, going back here, DF, notice on my machine at least, it's giving me autocomplete here. So it's allowing me to choose from among these. Another thing you can do though is you can press tab to get this same, so here, if you get dollar sign tab um, to actually see the options as well. And if you wanna use your mouse, you can actually click on it to choose them, but you can also use your arrow key um, to arrow between them and just push enter when you're on the one you want. I'm gonna choose biomarker value and then I wanna print that. So now I have a vector. So now I just access that vector. That's my third column here, okay? Another option though is to use square brackets, similar to what we did with the vector. But because a uh, data frame has two dimensions, you actually need a comma to specify what dimension are you slicing? Because uh, you could be either slicing the row dimension or you could be slicing the column dimension here. So here, I wanna access my first column. So I access it on the right-hand side of the comma. I say one and that's the first column. If I wanted to access the first row, I would type one, and then I would have a, a comma with empty space. When there's an empty space on one side of the comma, it means select everything, okay? So here, this is all rows because it's empty before the comma and just column one here, let me see. If you wanna specify your rows and your columns, um, then you could do that in two ways as well. So you could make it a vector first. So here I make it a vector by accessing that first column. And then I say, I want the third element of that first column, right? So row three of column one is the third element of the vector of column one. That's how I'm accessing it here. But I can also treat it as a two-dimensional object and say, give me the third row of the first column and slice it from that perspective. So I'm just gonna show you guys that over here. I, if I want biomarker value, so I want the third column, but I want uh, the fifth row, then I could do this. I could say, I want the fifth element of this biomarker value vector. Um, and here I've just put it in square brackets and then push enter. So that's 56. And you can tell because this, these are the row numbers here. So 56 is definitely the correct row number here. All right, so that's one way to do it. But I could also say DF, I could say I want the fifth row. So first is rows, then I have a comma. The space could be there or not, it doesn't matter. Um, and then I want the third column. So I could write three here and it's gonna give me the same value, the fifth row and the third column and it's gonna give me that value, all right? You can also put vectors into these positions, okay? So let's say we want, um, we want the second, third, and fifth row, okay? So now we use that concatenate function. We created a vector before. We're gonna create a vector here on the fly, two, three, five. So this is a vector in here. And this vector is an argument to the rows. So I want the second, third, and fifth row. And I want the only the third column. All right. So I can do that. And again, I'm getting 
the second, third, oops, sorry, second, third, and fifth rows of the third column. All right. So you can slice many different dimensions of your data frame using these techniques. Okay. We're going to go through this a bit more later. Um, so don't worry if it's like not totally solid yet. Um, it takes some time, but when you, once you've got it, you really will have it. Okay. All right. Now lists. Lists are amazing. I um, honestly, I discounted them a lot when I started R, but now I use them often. And once you get comfortable with them, they're very, very powerful for using. So a list, it's kind of just bulk storage. Um, a data frame is a very special version of a list because you have um, vectors. It, it's combining um, vectors that are all the same dimension. Um, so it could be thought of as that, but don't worry about it. Lists are much more flexible than that. So here I'm creating a list using the list function. And my list has two objects in it. I say object one is gonna be the name for my first object. This is totally arbitrary again, I've chosen this and I'm gonna make it my vector. And object two is gonna be the data frame that I created before, okay? So these are um, the, uh, the vectors that I created and when I created that first vector and object two is that data frame I created before and it's all stored in a list. And so see, it's just arbitrary. Vectors have to have the same type of data element continued. Um, data frames have to have columns that are the same length, but a list can have whatever. So a list is just binding together lots of arbitrary stuff. So if you wanna access things within a list, you need to use the um, double brackets or dollar signs. So if I want to access column two, so this one in um, object two here, I'm going to use my list dollar sign object two. So this gets me into object two. And then once I have that, then I use the same technique I used on my data frame. So then I say dollar sign header name two. So I access object two first, and then I access the second column of object two, all right? A second way you can do that is using these double brackets. So where we used a single bracket for our vectors and our data frames, for lists, you need to use double brackets to get access to the object in the list, okay? So here, my list, I go in and I get object two. Now this whole thing is a data frame from which I can use my dollar sign to access that second column. So I'm gonna do a little thing here I'm gonna say my list equals, um, and I'm gonna say list vec, uh, my vec is gonna be my first list element here. And I'm just gonna make um, this vec B, um, A, X, Y, Z. Okay, notice I'm using different uh, quotes, it's actually okay uh, to have double or single quotes here. Your list should be, or your um, vector should be fine with that, okay? And then I'm going to say uh, my df is going to be df that I had before, okay? So here, notice I'm creating this vector on the fly in here, and then this one, I'm actually assigning it by using an object I've already created in my environment. Both are fine to do, okay? So now I'm creating a list, my list. Once a list is created, it will be added to your environment. So I know that I have one. It's a list of two elements, okay? My list, um, I can access the names in it. If I'm not sure what's named, I can say names, my list, and I see my list's names, okay? And then similar to what I've done here, okay? I want to access biomarker value, this biomarker value column. So I know my DF is in the list, so I can say my list, I can use the dollar sign, my DF. So here I'm just arrowing down to it, but I could also start to type it and it will go to the top there. I can just tab to auto complete it, or I could have pushed enter there. If I just do this one, I'm just gonna get that whole data frame out, okay? So now, I wanna get that third column. So I just add another dollar sign there and boom, third column, all right? 
So you're just iteratively accessing these elements. All right, so another way we could have done that is my list, double brackets. I use the name for the element, my DF here, my DF. And then I can say dollar sign. Again, it's giving me the options. Yours may or may not do this, but you can often use tab. And then I can dollar sign, get that column. And then let's say that I wanna access the third or let's say the fifth element like I was before. I can, again, I can use those square brackets, just add it onto the end. And now I'm accessing that exact element. So I'm going into my list, I'm accessing my data frame, I go to the biomarker value column and I get the fifth element, all right? So again, this is a lot right now, but I think these things will solidify as we try them again and again and again, all right? So just to introduce you to this. All right, so I'm gonna recap Vector, vectors, they're one dimensional, data frames, two dimensional. So the vector, you use square brackets, no comma, data frames, square brackets, you need a comma, rows are before the comma, column after the comma, lists, one dimensional, but they're bulk. And the reason I say one dimensional is you can also, instead of here, instead of writing the name of it, I could have also said two, because it's the second element of my list, that is also giving me the, um, the whole data frame, okay? So in those square brackets, I can also just say which number, but they're going to be only a single sequence of numbers. There's no two dimensions here. Once you get into the data frame, then you can be accessing things like a two dimensional object. So here again, I can say, um, I want the second, third and fifth row, and I want the third column. And I'm doing this on the second element of my list, which is a data frame, then I can do that. Okay, so now I'm doing a two dimensional extraction here. Okay, so lists, they're one dimensional bulk storage, um, and it just can be anything all bound together. All right. All right, so here, we're importing our data as a data frame. So once you do that read CSV function, it's going to bring your data into your R environment and it's a data frame. It's a two dimensional object that you're now um, using with your data, all right? So you've named your data frame DF. That's why it creates that DF object in your, um, uh, in your environment pane. Uh, the file name containing the data is here. We have header equals true because we have headers. As is equals true, it means that don't convert the variables into a grouping variable, just treat it as a string. Um, and of course, we have our object, our function, and then these are all arguments to our function. So the first argument is the data name or the file name. The second argument is header equals true and as is equals true is our third argument here. And you can press tab. Again, I'm going to emphasize this again and again because if there's any spelling error, you're gonna get um, uh, error uh, message in your um, environment or in your console. And so uh, pressing tab helps you avoid those kinds of spelling errors. All right, so you place your cursor on line six, control enter, you should have DF show up here. It should be eight observations, three variables. You should also see it run down there and once you guys have um, DF in your environment, go ahead and click yes. You'll notice if your working directory is not set correctly, it's it's going to give you an error too. So that's um, a way to know if you actually set it to the place you want. All right, it looks like we're close. Don't forget to click yes, very nice. All right. Good deal. Okay, perfect. And it looks like we have a lot of people on a 
second machine as well. All right. And if there's any issues, remember to click no or to message um, on the Slack or message the TAs uh, to have a breakout room set. Okay. All right. I'm going to say that's okay. Or yes clicks. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and clear all. And we'll keep moving on and we're going to take a break here soon. I like to have a break um, about every hour um, just so we're all staying fresh. Um, so let's just move on to data frames. So we've talked about this already. Data frames, they're fundamental data structure used in R. And it's just a collection of variables with the same number of rows and unique row names. So you um, cannot have the same row name um, as I showed you here. Usually the row names are just numbers. So that's what they are here. Um, so that keeps them unique here. Um, and then once you've had it read in, it'll go to your environment tab and it's a great way to verify that you've read it in. You can also click this little guy here um, and it will give you a, a kind of view of it. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and click it. And here we go. It opens it up in a kind of spreadsheet view. This is a nice way to just have a look at your data um, in case like you're not sure what you're looking at or what's read in and, and just making sure it's correct. Okay. All right. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, have a break right now um, for five minutes. Um, and then when we come back, we'll start talking about grouping variables. Okay. So everyone can just uh, refresh their water, um, you know, go. Okay, so now uh, we're on our next line of code here. We've read our data into our environment. We've got it in our environment pane, good to go. Uh, two lines of code really need to have been run, um, but you could have run many, many more and that's fine too. Um, so we need our working directory set and our data frame read in or our data read in and it's saved in a data frame. From here, we're gonna create a grouping variable. And so I've been talking about these grouping variables. This as is equals true um, is uh, alludes to them. So as is equals true means R, don't create my grouping variable for me. I want to create it for myself. But very oftentimes in research, we have a variable that is categorical. Here we have cases and controls um, and we've encoded them though numerically. So even though they're a category, we don't want it to be interpreted as a number uh, like we have it shown here. So uh, we need to tell R that it's categorical and not a number. Um, so first though, um, I'm gonna go a deep dive into the dollar sign, which we've seen quite a bit of. So to access certain variables, we use the dollar sign. Here, uh, we're accessing exposure like uh, we did previously talking about data frames and also lists but you can also create a new variable using this dollar sign. Um, so here you can access exposure, but you can also create exposure group um, here using this dollar sign. So type DF exposure to access exposure. You can also highlight a snippet of your code and run it to just see that part. So here I'm gonna actually go to my R script here what I'm saying is I can just highlight this piece of code and then I can go control enter and it will just run that individual piece of code. So where before um, I was showing, you can run the whole line. You have your cursor anywhere on this line at the end of the line, um, at the beginning of the line, <coughs> pardon, <coughs> at the beginning of the line, you can even highlight the whole line and run it, but you don't need to. I only want it. So here, I only want this part of my line of code run. So I just highlight it. Um, and it only runs what is selected. Okay. Um, also notice here to clean up my code. I actually pushed enter and I created multiple lines. And so R is okay with that. You can actually break up your code across multiple lines here. Um, but it's best, in my opinion, to do it after a comma um, because R will align it here for you. It will know that you're continuing to write in your function. You haven't closed your parenthesis yet, right? So we have an open parenthesis here. 
you haven't closed it yet. So it'll line you up to keep adding in uh, things down there. All right. So anyway, all that is to say, I'm going to bring that back. You can highlight this and run. So once you guys have highlighted and run DF exposure, go ahead and click yes. So I just want to see it. You just want to see that one vector. Just a vector of ones and zeros. Okay. We're close. Looks like a few more. Great. All right. So from here, Vectors, we already talked about, they're one dimensional objects. Here, ours is eight, eight um, zeros and ones all concatenated together. If you want to know the length of your vector here, it's very easy for us to just count. But suppose you have hundreds of numbers, maybe you want to know how many there are, you can use the length function. And so if you use length around DF dollar sign exposure, then you'll see there's eight um characters or elements of this um vector here okay so now we want to create a grouping variable though out of that zeros and ones vector all right so a factor it's a it's a term used in r for grouping variables or categorical variables all right so to do categorical analysis you have to define factors Otherwise, if R sees any numbers, it's going to interpret it as a numerical value and it's going to treat it that way. It will not treat anything else um, as a, a category. OK, um, so in the example below, we want our exposure group. Um, so our new variable to have two levels, case and control, and we want it to correspond to the zeros and ones that we see um, in that exposure uh, variable. So the first level is the baseline in all analyses. In our case, it's not such a big deal, um, which is the baseline, though in general you want control to be baseline, right? And you want to measure the effect of being a case. Or you may have um, non-exposed group, you want to measure the effect of the exposure. Um, and so in that case, you kind of want your um, baseline to be no exposure or control. And your um, next level that you compare to it to be exposure or case. Um, it becomes much more complex if you have multiple groups, so uh, more than two. So let's say you have um, multiple cities, um, then you need to choose a city, one of your cities to be your baseline group, and all the other cities will be compared to that one. So setting the first one um, is the most important. And the way that's done is uh, in order, okay? So here, if you run the line of code that is shown, you will get this output from your DF uh, exposure group here. But here we're setting the levels C01, right? Because we got zeros and ones here. Um, we're setting zero to be the first group and one to be the second group. So zero is the baseline. It's the, it's the group that everything else will be compared to. And in this case, we only have one other group. So everything else is just cases, all right? And we're labeling, labeling them control and case and these labels are corresponding to the order of the zero one here okay so when you run this line you'll just see this full line here run no output but again if you select just this piece and you say i just want to see df exposure group i want to see this output then you can see this levels control case down here, this is telling you that control is the baseline level and case will be compared to it. And then this is showing you your actual data. So control, 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 case, 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 which is what we expect to see because we had four zeros followed by four ones. And all of those zeros should be controls as is shown here. These are all controls and all the ones should be cases, okay? So the zeros consist of ones and zeros, or the variable group consists of ones and zeros. We want to tell R this is a factor. We use the factor function here, and we're going to use it there. Dollar sign, we're adding a new variable. 
it called Exposure Group 2DF. All right. We're building our new variable from the existing group variable, DF exposure. All right. So it says, OK, I'm going to create a new factor. I want to add it as a variable to DF. The, I want to use this variable to create this factor. So I'm going to reference this variable to create this factor. The levels are going to be zeros and ones. And zero is my baseline because I'm setting it first here um, in order. And I would like to label these variables as control and case. And so here we match the order zero, one, and control case. All right. And so all the zeros are called controls and all the ones are called cases. And zero and control is my baseline group. All right. So once you guys have created this, um, there's a few ways you can check it. You can either do what I did here, where you highlight it and you are able to print the output. You could also go ahead and look here you have four variables that's good so a variable will have been created you could go to view and you can see you've got a new variable here um, that's another way to check it you can also uh, just print your whole df so you could say df here um, and then that will also show it okay so there's multiple different ways to check but once you've done it go ahead and click yes um, and make sure that we all have a, a nice factor added to that data frame You can actually use the indexes uh, that I showed you before too. You could select the fourth column um, of your data frame to see it. Awesome, looks like we're almost there. And also go ahead and click no too if you're, if you're encountering issues. Even if you're the only one to encounter this issue this time, um, often the same bugs will keep coming up for people. Great, who's got a no um, here? Ran. Um, you can go ahead and you can open your mic and talk to the group, or you can go ahead and Slack. Um, I'll get on the Slack channel. Um, hey, um, hey. Sorry. So I you you mentioned we should see something at the environment uh, kind of bracket, and I don't mm -hmm. see anything there. So in environment, you should have DF. I have the DF, yeah. I have okay, that. and are there four variables? Yes, okay. Perfect, great. And then you can oh, no, click nothing view. New okay. Yep, so it should be good to go. That's great though, perfect. Okay, okay. All right. Oh, got that, okay, perfect, thank you. Perfect, no problem. Oops, I'm just highlighting everything here, okay. All and right. Sorry to interrupt. There's a question in Slack. Um, I do not don't know how to see it, it in the environment. OK, so the environment is just the pane here. Sometimes it's down below. So sometimes these two are swapped um, in how they're laid out. Um, so you should see DF in your environment. Um, and if you don't see DF, then that means that you haven't read in your data. So then if there's no DF here, you'll want to go back to this line, have your cursor on it, control enter to make sure that you read it in. And then you'll run this line next, control enter. So see how once I rerun DF, I actually overwrite the change I made. So I reran DF here. I'll do it again. So just cursor on that line, control enter. Now, when I look in my environment pane, I've got three variables. OK, so it, went, it reverted back to the original one that I read in. And so now I would need to run this new line again to get that fourth variable. So then you control enter and you see a fourth variable is added on there. All right. Wonderful. All right. Good deal. Okay. Nicely done, everyone. So we'll go ahead and clear all and move right along. We've got a factor now. Um, and your output should look like this. We've already uh, checked our output. And so, like I said before, you can highlight a snippet of code you'd like to run. Or if you want to see your whole output, you can actually surround your whole command with parentheses and it will print the whole output at the same time as running the code. So just to show you guys here more concretely, let's say I wanted to see this output. So what this is 
here, I want to see this at the same time as I'm creating the variable. So I'm going to start from the top. I'm rereading in my data back from three. And I want to see the output when I create it. I put a parenthesis here and at the beginning. See how when I have my parenthesis here, it highlights this one. This entire uh, command is now surrounded by parentheses. If I run this, it prints this output, but it also added that fourth variable at the same time. So it will do both at the same time for you. Okay, so that's just another thing you can do if you really want to see the output when you run the command, you just put parentheses around the whole thing. Okay. But here, another way you could check it is even to go and just click this view here. Notice whenever I'm clicking that, actually I'll, I'll put it here. Whenever I'm clicking this, so here I'm clicking it, I can see this, it runs this command. So you can also go and see your data programmatically by using the view command. So here I'll get rid of this and I'll just do the entire thing programmatically. It's a capital V, I, E, W, D, F, and then it'll open that for me. So similar to when we set our working directory, R is using your clicks to run a command that you could also just run that command on your own if you'd like. All righty. So we created our factor. Now we're gonna do ggplot. So what, now we want to make a plot using the ggplot2 package, okay? So everyone go ahead and run this library command. I just want to make sure it's in. So it will have run here. Um, sometimes it will say warning. It's made in this, um, uh, made from version R or something. Um, but once that's run, go ahead and click yes. And I want to just make sure we're all on the same page with ggplot ready to go. So library ggplot there. It'll run there. You can also look in your packages and it will have a check mark now, having been libraried in. So this is being on this list mean, means it's an installed package. Having the check mark means that it's libraried in. So now all of those functions in ggplot2, they're accessible um, to me in the R environment. Okay, so about half of us have it. Remember to click yes once you've just run that ggplot. It's just library ggplot2. Great. Good, good. Okay. Okay. I think we're ready to go. Okay. All right. So ggplot2 is awesome. It is a super powerful plotting tool. So um, we've gone over this before. To use ggplot2, you need to have installed the package and libraried those functions into your R environment. Um, this is one cheat sheet you can use for ggplot2. There are so many. There are um, lots of like very simple tutorials on how to use it available online. So I really encourage you to use it. Um, I don't think you need to memorize a lot about ggplot2. So you don't need to memorize every little function and change. Um, I often am Googling myself um, just, uh, you know, how could I make um, a violin plot with ggplot2, a heat map with ggplot2, et cetera. It is very easy to find these solutions online. Um, but I, what I want to impress upon you guys today is um, kind of the overall syntax and logic of ggplot2. Um, so that you know how to um, add to it and debug it and, and kind of get your head around um, creating just even the basic plot. Okay, so ggplot2 plots, they're made up of layers. Okay, and these layers, they're put on top of each other. And so um, if you ever work with like a, a vector graphics kind of program, um, like um, I believe Publisher will let you do this, but I use Inkscape myself. If I export a ggplot object, I'm able to take those layers apart. So they are literal layers um, being plot on top of each other, okay? Um, so here you can see the first layer or the base layer is uh, the plot pane, the background. Um, the next layer is the bars. And then I put error bars on top of my bars and it results in a layered plot that shows my plot with my bar plot and then error bars um, on the values themselves, okay? 
Um, and each layer, it contains a visual object, like I said. So here um, we've got the background, like the pane. Um, a bar is another visual object. Error bars are more visual objects. And these are basically called geoms um, in ggplot2, and they're added using the plus sign. So it's a kind of different um, syntax than a lot of our programming. So uh, like I said, you know, bars, error bars, text, you can just add them on top. Um, and you have to tell R what geom you want displayed when you define a layer. Um, geoms have aesthetic properties. So you can make them either, um, maybe you want all your error bars to be the color red. You can also make them um, variable. So you could say, I want all my control uh, data to be colored red and I want all my case data to be colored blue in a scatter plot, for example. So geoms are flexible to these kinds of um, uh, changes to their appearance. Um, and these aesthetic properties, they're referred to as AES. So AES is a function that you'll use within ggplot to give um, geoms those variable kind of um, uh, aesthetics, okay? So I'm gonna list out a lot of geoms no need to memorize these. I think a handful will do like geom point, for example. Um, but here, so geom bar creates a layer with bars. So like a bar plot, okay? Geom point, uh, a layer showing data points. So like a scatter plot. Uh, geom line, it'll give you a line plot. Um, geom smooth, it actually um, gives you a line that summarizes your data. Um, so it, it actually does some calculations um, and will summarize your data. Geom histogram, you've got a histogram, you can add text, um, you can add, uh, you can have a density plot, so kind of like a histogram, but smoothed uh, to show the distribution. You can add error bars with geom error bar, um, geom ab line or v line um, or h line, I believe also. Uh, you can add uh, lines, you know, so maybe you want a reference line on your plot. Uh, that's how you can add that. So. Suffice to say, this is a short list of a very, very long list of geoms uh, that can be added to your um, ggplot. Um, so no need to memorize them, but this is just to illustrate kind of the logic of how they're named and, and how you might even guess uh, the name of the one that you would need. So the basic command structure with the ggplot is you start with ggplot. So you actually use the ggplot function, and this defines just the overall graph. So the data is the first thing that you're going to be referencing in this. So you say ggplot, and then my data frame, whatever your data frame is here. And then you go to use the AES function to define the aesthetic properties of your plot. And so in general, this is going to give your x-axis variable, your y-axis variable, and your color. Sometimes you'll have a plot that doesn't have two axes, in which case you wouldn't have both axes here. Um, you could just have X or Y, for example. Um, and then here, um, I'm saying color equals sex because I want my, um, the color uh, of my whatever geom uh, to be variable based on the sex column. So this here is saying there is some column in my data frame that is called sex. Um, that I want uh, color to be variable based on. One second, I just noticed a bug in my code here. Um, I would have gotten an error if I used this because there was no um, closed parentheses. So see here, I have an open parenthesis um, for my AES and I wanna close it here. And then you'll need to also close your ggplot parenthesis here. So this is one complete command that's run here. Okay, so I just wanted to correct that. Uh, and save it before. Good. Okay. Um, so that's our function here. Uh, it's called ggplot, of course. Um, we're referencing the data frame. You define your aesthetics. As I said, this is the foundation of your ggplot. This line is not going to um, produce anything on its own. This is actually just telling ggplot, here's the baseline of the plot I'm creating. Okay. Um, and then here is where you add layers to this kind of foundation that you've created. And like I said, you add them using the plus sign. So literally, you write your ggplot um, function here out, your ggplot command, you add your geom, uh, and then you have your additional geom specified here. So 
here's an example from your own script. You've got ggplot, you, use, you call the ggplot function, you reference your data frame, that's df, and here we're defining the aesthetics. We've got our x variable is our exposure group. So on the x axis, we want exposure group, and this is the factor variable we described or we defined before. Um, and our y variable is our biomarker value. So we want to have our biomarker value um, be shown on our y axis. And we're going to add a geom. And the geom we're going to add is geom box plot. And we add that using this plus sign. OK. Now you're going to add layers to your foundation here. So geom box plot is the next function, the geom here. And here we're defining an AES where we say we want the fill. So the, the color filling up our box plot to be exposure group, OK? We actually could have put this up here in the base of our plot, um, and it actually wouldn't make a big difference. The, the main difference is if you put um, fill equals exposure group in your AES here, um, then it's going to uh, apply to every geom you create. So every fill is going to be there. But because we only have one geom, it's the same, OK? So fill could be inside, just to repeat, it could be inside box plot or this AES fill, or we could have added a new, uh, a comma here um, within this AES function up in our main ggplot and had fill equals exposure group up here, okay? And that should produce this graph, okay? And this is the graph you all um, should have produced in your pre-work, all right? So this is where it came from. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and make sure everybody has this graph. You all should have had it through your pre-work. Just go ahead and click yes um, to make sure it's showing up here. Awesome. We got a lot of clicks. Yes. Very rapid. All right. Okay. I think we're good. Very nice. Perfect. Okay, guys. So now you've got it made. Let's uh, improve this. Like this isn't really a plot I would personally put in a um, in a uh, uh, paper uh, of any kind because of a lot of a lot of aspects about this. First, um, these axis labels they're not they're kind of our um, variable names. Uh, they're data frame names. They're not so nice. Um, they're also very small, so we want to fix that. The legend title too. It's the name from that column and. It's, it does, doesn't look right. Like uh, we should make it more human readable. Um, the background should be white. I don't really like the uh, default uh, ggplot backgrounds. Um, the default colors, I don't know about the salmon and turquoise. Uh, I think we should also change that. Um, yeah, so let's do it. So first, the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna take our original plot script here that we have and we're gonna add to it. Here. So we add a geom. So we already had this plus sign. We made a box plot. Now we're going to add a geom called scale fill manual. Okay. And this is going to be changing the um, colors of our box plot. And it's going to change the label um, of that uh, legend that we have. Okay. So First off, we need the factor labels to correspond exactly to the color. So these are capital C control, capital C case equals blue and dark orchid. This is allowing us to specify the exact color that we want for the exact factor. OK, so that's why it's scale fill manual. We're very manually um, assigning colors and factors uh, to each other here. OK. Um, oh. I just noticed we have a no. I want to make sure um, the person who's having issues with this. Um, could you check in with your TAs? Or if you'd like to open up your mic with the issue you're having, that also is fine. Hi, I think without holding everybody, can I just go to the TAs? Perfect. Because All I, right. I pressed enter in the wrong window. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. So if you press enter in the wrong window, it's no problem. I do want to hold up everyone for this just because it happens sometimes. So one thing, um, you could either have just you pushed enter, it didn't work, 
or you could have here, you push enter and then it's like, oh crap, like it just separated it. No. Um, you just wanna put it back together and just control enter once you're on that line, okay? So okay. Uh, if you separate it, you know, sometimes, right? Like it's just a mistake. I just do control Z to get back, undo that, and mm -hmm. then control enter on the line. Hmm. And if you're still having issues, I'll go ahead and let you go to uh, a TA. Yes, I think because now it can't even find the GG plot. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so All I'll right. let one of the TAs plot. bring you to a room. Thank you so much for bringing that up, though, because uh, again, just because everybody didn't encounter the error this time, many of us will encounter these same errors. So um, I think it's really good for us all to talk about them together. Um, all right, thank you. Um, how do I go into breakout room? Yeah, um, Greg, are you able to? Um... Yep, I'm, I've just invited her. Wonderful, all right. To your breakout room. Perfect, all right, great. So just moving on, um, and I'm sure she'll catch up because uh, I can send the code right along. Um, we're going to be adding again, uh, specifying our scale fill manual values here, and then the legend title updating here. So we want it to be exposure. All right. So once you've added this code in um, and you've gotten your plot um, updated, you don't actually have to use these colors. You can change the colors to red, white, pink, you know, whatever you'd like, experiment with it. I put dark orchid. I like that one. Dodger blue is another nice one. Um, go have at it. Uh, but once you've been able to modify your plot to the colors you want and change your legend name, go ahead and click yes. And you should run this whole line. So you can have your cursor anywhere on this line and run it. Um, or you can highlight the whole line and run it. Um, but you should have a new plot in your plotting pane. Great, we've got two people already. All right, so the person who's a no, um, if you'd like, you can open up your mic um, or uh, we can have a, a TA take you to a breakout room. Yeah, so got it. an unexpected symbol. I'm pretty sure I copied exactly what you put, but maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so a few things uh, could be there. So. Um, an unexpected symbol could be you're missing a equal sign. Um, sometimes you just need to run the line again, um, honestly. Um, uh, but I think a breakout room would be good. Uh, Gabby, do you think you could take um, the people with the nose? Uh, we've got two nose here to a breakout room. Oof, just, we got three. Yeah, just sorry. Sorry, please ask your question on Slack. So just we can uh, keep track as mm -hmm. the, the TA will be on and off from the breakout rooms. Ask your question on Slack with a screenshot and we will answer it there or we will make a breakout room. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rashad. Actually, that's a great idea too. Um, if you put a screenshot in the Slack, um, we can see it and we can actually debug together. Um, so if you just take a picture of similar to what I'm showing here, your line, awesome, love this, okay. So what's happening here is uh, case is actually an open parenthesis. Uh, so it looks like uh, where uh, case would be written. Um, it's um, exiting out of your um, kind of quotes there. Ah, and the other thing that's happening is blue. Uh, you don't close your um, quotes on blue. Um, so for Emma, for yours, you wanna make sure that control open quote, close quote equals open quote, close quote, blue, and then a comma, open quote, case, close quote, equals, open quote, name of the uh, whatever color, here's dark orchid, close quote, and then close your parentheses. And then this, notice, is a, um, it's a named vector. So we've created a vector using concatenate here, okay? All right, let's look at Alex's. Uh -huh. 
So Alexander, you're experiencing the exact same thing, except you have a double quote after Dark Orchid here. So you're going to want to delete one of those quotes, and then that line should run just fine. Thank you. I just fixed that. <laughs> Wonderful. Again, you know, just because you're the one having the error this time, I often have these errors myself. So um, it's very good for us to share. I'm just going to zoom in on this one. Yep. And then this one, um, Ran, you've got a double quote here before Dark Orchid. So another nice thing is R is highlighting where uh, you have quoted. You want to make sure that control is a, a different color, right? Blue is a different color, case is a different color, dark orchid, but nothing else. These parentheses, these equal signs, these commas, these are all um, separated. Okay. Awesome. Let's see what we have now. Okay. Control case equals dark orchid. Mm -hmm. Arlang um, cannot use GG with single argument. Hmm. Nagla, hi. Uh, do you want to try highlighting the whole line? I'm wondering what's going on there. That is, that is actually a, a bit more difficult. Values equals. Hmm. I think what might be happening is, um, hmm, try putting them all on one line. So when I'm saying that, what I mean is um, just take this and kind of string them together. <clears throat> I wonder if that will um, fix it because it seems like it's getting a new line issue here. And you're going to want to make sure that your new line is happening after this plus sign. So you have a plus sign and then new line and a plus sign and then new line. And then when you run it, try to, I think the cursor on the first line is probably best. Let's try with the cursor on the second line. Nope, it should be fine too. All right. Okay. All right, everyone. I'm going to see how Nagla is doing here, and then we'll. Okay. All right. So, um, could one of our TAs please take uh, Nagla to a breakout room? I agree. They that. are both in the breakout room. That's why, please put your question on Slack. Like, I okay. think by default, put it on Slack and then open your mic if you want to, but put it on Slack so we can track it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So once they're back, they'll bring you into a breakout room, Nagla. Okay. Wonderful. And I'm going to keep going. Okay. Does it matter how many plus signs are used? Yes. So there's only one plus sign. Um, so each section um, here, so you have one section and then a plus sign, and then you'll have another piece of your code and then you'll add the next piece with a plus sign here. It's showing two plus signs because this is R saying this is a new line. So this plus sign here um, on this side is not actually part of the code. It's just R speaking to itself saying, this is all part of the same command. Um, and it's just coming together uh, through that enter. So through those new lines um, that are there. Really good question, Christina. Okay. 
All right, we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, and uh, Greg, can you please take Nagla to a, a breakout room? No, sorry. Can you please go to the Slack, try to answer? So first, first answer question, like with yeah. the screenshots. Yeah, and so um, yeah, so Rashad, we already have uh, for Nagla. Um, that's why I'm hoping Greg can take her. Yeah, there is three screenshots before Nagla, that's why. Uh, they are all resolved. Okay. Yeah. So maybe can you put a check or something because if the TA came back. Good idea. So guys, um, I'm going to share my Slack here. Or maybe you can just answer uh, done like on the thread. Yeah, once you've got it, if it's good to go, um, I'm just going to do this on yours, Emma, just to show. Um, if it's good to go, just go ahead and put a check mark. So if you've got an error, um, um, then just put a check mark uh, when it's like resolved. Um, I'm going to take, yeah, perfect. That's great. Um, great. Okay. Thank you guys. Awesome. And Nagla got it working. She had an extra plus sign. Perfect. I love to see this. All right. So we're good to go. We've all updated our graph to have custom colors and also changed this um, this legend title here. Okay. So I'm going to clear our check mark here and we're just going to move right along. So here it's updated. Still not exactly what we want. We, we still have some changes to make, but the colors are custom now. Okay. Now we want the background to be white and we want larger text. Okay, so these still not publication quality. There are several ways to do it, but the way I actually like to do it the most is to do a theme set before I run my ggplot here. Um, and this um, syntax is a little weird looking. You don't have to do it this way, um, but it, for me, it's a bit clearer, okay? So here, this is the previous script. So this is what we used already. And what you wanna add upstream of that is this theme set. So I say theme set, and then what theme set does is it says, okay, tell me what theme you want to use um, for this graph, um, and I will set it to that. And then within that, I'm saying I want theme classic, and I want my base size to be 20. So that means my text and everything. I want it to be um, starting from the base of point size 20. So that's like uh, when you're setting your text size in a Word document. 20 um, is what I'm setting here. So you guys, you can choose a different base size. You can either even use your tab to auto-complete when you write theme to see if there's different themes you'd like to try, like theme black, white, whatever. Um, but what you'll do next is you'll run this and then run this and it should update your plot, okay? So once you've added this to uh, before your plot, you run it and now you reran your plot. So all of this has to be rerun. Go ahead and click yes. You should have uh, a nice plain background. You should have bigger uh, text sizes um, and your graph should be getting to the point that we'd like it at, okay? So nice, we've got four people who it's working for. And again, just screenshot your error messages um, if, you're, if you're running into issues, um, we can all learn from them. Great, we've got a lot of yeses. And for those of you who've gotten it to work, you know, go ahead and play with different colors, different base sizes, and also different themes. There's so many different themes that are available to you. And maybe you find that you don't like theme classic as much as uh, some other ones. Um, there's other ones that give you grid lines that maybe are useful um, uh, for certain contexts, for example. Okay. All right, just waiting for a few more people to get it. Awesome, and don't forget to click yes once you've got it working. Are the uh, the way you have the brackets and the spaces, the way it jumps that you have pretty much mm -hmm. is spread out on three different lines, is that also very important as well? No, it's not. Great question. It's not a necessity. You could actually have these three lines in one single line. So theme set, theme classic, base size, and just close your parentheses. That's totally fine. This is just to illustrate that you can add these additional lines just to um, spread it out and make it easier to read in your code if you'd like. 
but thanks for asking. That's a really good question. And so um, when I when I run it, um, do I highlight that entire block? You, you don't need to. Yeah. So if your cursor is just on the first line here, yeah. you want to um, highlight in general, like outside the the parentheses here. But if your cursor is on the first line, it should run the full uh, sequence. Awesome. Yeah, I just had the same problem that I had before, which I mentioned was uh, when I run it, it just doesn't, it seems to do what it's supposed to do, but I don't see the plot. The plot That's doesn't. Right. So if you just run theme set, you just set the theme. So then you want to run the plot again, and it will now run it with a new theme. Okay. Okay, we've got a few more people still working on it. The name equals part of, yeah, this part here, um, this is naming uh, the, I suppose it's naming the factors. It's, it's for the legend title. It's saying, here's what all my factors are called basically. Um, so the legend, uh, you want it to be called in this case, exposure. Um, so it will update it to exposure where before it was, um, I believe it was exposure value um, or factor perhaps. Um, I'm gonna change screens really quick here. Um, exposure group. Um, so now it updated it to just exposure here. Um, and so just to run uh, what we wanted here. So uh, like was said before, uh, you just run theme set, nothing, you're not gonna see anything. It's just updating the theme. Now you rerun your graph and it will update that theme in your graph. So now we've got a lot bigger text um, and it's a plain white background. Um, and as I was saying before, you can actually change this to different themes. So instead of classic, I'm gonna get rid of that. I'm gonna tab and I can see, wow, there's like a lot of different options. So let's see theme line draw, for example, okay? So theme set, theme line draw, see, I could run it with it anywhere on the line. Again, that actually doesn't have to be across three different lines. So here I could actually just have it on one line. It's just a little bit uh, more difficult to uh, parse apart with it all in one line. Now here, I'm gonna run it again. So see, this didn't update when I updated my theme. This theme is just updated in the background and now I'm running it again. And now this is what theme line draw is giving me. Okay, so there's lots of different themes to choose from. And you can really find the right one for your specific application or use, okay? Um, Christine uh, is asking, is there a way to see what all the options will look like for theme set? Yes, uh, I think Google is the best way. Um, there's likely a, a guide you could find online that will uh, probably show each of them. There's also specific packages with different themes because I believe there's like a theme economist or um, you know themes that are actually matching the formats of different um, publications. Uh, so you can actually even have your um, graph match that publications format. Um, so yeah, there, there's lots of ways uh, to look at the different themes, but other than running them within R, there's no way to see them uh, unless you Google it, basically. So um, I would look up ggplot theme options. All righty, yeah. Okay, cool guys. So, Oh, perfect. Thank you, Gabby. She's adding to our notes, all the themes. So GG theme, um, these will give you all the different themes you can use. Um, but like I said, there's even additional themes you can always add. This is awesome. Wonderful. Okay. So now let's keep going. We're not quite there yet. It's really a lot nicer than it was before, but I still don't want biomarker underscore value and exposure group without a, with no space. Um, as my axis labels, okay? So now we need to update these two. And the way you would do that is again, plus sign. And it, it doesn't have to be a new line. Um, we could just do plus sign and keep writing our code um, onto the right. 
but uh, if your screen is anything like mine, it's it's pretty limited in space. So plus sign, new line here, lowercase x lab, and I want my x label to be exposure groups. And then I'm closing that. Make sure that this is in quotes and make sure the quotes are closing. Uh, as we saw, that's a, a major source of errors. Um, and this in quotes, it can be whatever you'd like it to be. So here I'm calling it exposure groups. You could just call it exposure, for example, if you'd like. Um, and then I'm adding another um, geom here. Again, these are layers on top, right? I'm adding my Y lab, lowercase y lab. Um, and then this is going to be the label on my Y axis. And I want it to be biomarker value. Again, make sure you close those quotes. Um, and to be clear, this is the previous script. So we wrote all this, we ran all this, added a plus sign, and uh, now are specifying our X and Y labels. And each of these are separate. So you could only add an X label if you wanted or only add a Y label if you wanted. Um, but here we're adding both um, with a plus sign on top. Okay, so once you've got it all looking good, go ahead and click yes. And one thing you may notice is you don't actually have to run theme again. So this theme set, this actually is set now for any ggplot you make for the rest of the time. Um, and if you don't want that theme to be the one anymore, you have to now theme set something different. Um, so you'd have to rerun it with a different theme if you wanna stop having your ggplots have that theme. Okay, so um, here, this doesn't need to be rerun. You just need to add these two, uh, xlab and ylab here and then run your ggplot part of your function. Okay, great. We've got six people have got it already. Don't forget to click yes once you have your nice graph. And then, you know, again, play with the colors, um, the sizes, check different base sizes. You know, maybe it's too large really for the aspect ratio that you're using here. Try different themes. Check out what uh, Gabby linked to if you have time or even write notes uh, and contribute to the Google Doc. Awesome, looks like we're getting there couple more. Great. Okay. So you should have something looking like this. So this is actually something you could put in a publication, right? You've got nice access labels. It's all a size that you can actually read. Um, you've got a nice um, legend here that is easy to read and understand. Notice in the legends, what um, ggplot does is it, it just puts a miniature version of your um, data's kind of graph there. So these are just box plots. It's just giving two box plots and it's saying the controls are the blue box plot and the cases are the purple block, box plot here, okay? Um, and we've been able to control exactly the colors that we want inside here. Um, and uh, yeah, and then make it a nice white background because that's what we prefer in this scenario. So you read in a data frame, we looked at view using the view function uh, to see what your data frame looks like. Um, you can also use commands such as length and dim uh, to find properties out about your data frame. Sometimes you wanna get the exact values of these out um, because maybe you're doing something that will use them as variables. For example, like the number of uh, participants in your study could be the, the number of rows in your data frame. Um, and so then maybe you wanna save that as a variable, for example. So you can access these things programmatically. Length, we actually already used it uh, to look at the length of our vector uh, for exposure before. Um, dim gives you the number of rows and the columns in a matrix or a data frame, okay? So rows are always first, columns are always second in R, all right? So when dim outputs values, it's gonna output two numbers, rows and columns. I've said this many times, but I cannot stop repeating it because this will help you so much with, um, you know, 
making you, you code faster and having fewer errors um, if you're auto completing. Um, so if you press tab, um, what's available to you in your environment will be made uh, clear um, you know, after a dollar sign as you start to type your variable. Um, so using tab autocomplete uh, is a very powerful aspect of our studio and I think a major reason for using our studio in the first place. Alrighty. Um, so here, go ahead and write up uh, and look at your variables. So you want to do dim DF length DF exposure and dim DF exposure, and then view the output down here and uh, go ahead and click yes once you've been able to get that. And this will just give us, um, get us started, uh, make sure everyone's on the same page at this point. So dim length and dim again. And if you're encountering errors, please just screenshot them, put them in the Slack We'll decode it together. Um, or you can even just request a breakout room too um, in the Slack channel. So we've got some people have already. Great. Don't forget to click yes once you've gotten this output. And notice dim is two values, eight and four. So there's eight rows. That's great. That's expected. So dim DF exposure, null. Yeah, we're going to talk about why that's null. All right. Go ahead. Make sure to click yes once you got it. And we'll move along. Also, feel free to click, uh, like, check out the dimensions or length of other um, objects, you know, um, maybe different variables, um, different dimensions. Excellent. Also, before we talk about it, you're free to uh, uh, speculate why the dimension of DF exposure would be null. Awesome. All right. So it looks like we have all but the last few. I'm going to jump into what's going on. Um, yeah. So first, um, one tip is uh, exactly, Rand got it. First, I'm going to go back here. Why is this null? I was going to talk about it in a few slides, but here it's one dimensional. OK, so there's no dimensions. Dim is looking for a two dimensional object. If it doesn't get a two dimensional object, it's just going to give you null. OK, so that's the that is the correct output. That is what you should expect there. So length is going to be giving you the length of your object. You could try length with your data frame and see it's going to give you the number of columns only. Um, so it's then if you use length on a data frame, it's thinking about it like a list, um, but a dim of a vector. It's no, there's no dimensions. It's one dimensional. OK. Um, if you guys are um, using a function and you're just not sure, like, what are the arguments to this? Can I use this? How, like, what does it use? Maybe you get um, dim equals null and you're like, is this right? You can use the question mark um, and then uh, the name of the function and then just enter and it'll open in your help pane. So just to make this a bit more concrete here, question mark dim. In my help pane, it opens it up, dim. Um, and then it will give a matrix, array, or data frame. So here, uh, if there's a value input, so a value would be a vector, um, you'll get null. Um, so it'll be a null output for that, OK? You can also assign dimensions. Um, so that's what it's saying here. You could say, uh, I want the dimensions of, of my object to be three and four. Um, so you can also assign them here. Notice also what it's showing is an arrow instead of an equal sign. So here, instead of an equal sign here, R also allows you to do a caret and a dash to make an arrow. 
um, as well as just an equal sign. I'm using the equal sign in pretty much everything because it's only one character. Um, so I just find that easier, but the arrow um, is also fine to use, okay? So dim, we've got dim, length, and then the dim of the exposure is null, okay? Now, uh, what did your data frame look like? How about names for your data frame? Head allows you to see the first six rows of data. Names is showing you the column names um, that you have. So um, for head, uh, you have to tell R in the parentheses which data frame you wanna see the names or the head of, okay? So here I have names BF and it's giving me the names. Um, and then this, I created this in Excel. And so for some reason it's giving me this weird kind of umlaut um, beginning. And then head, it's showing my first six rows. So that's what it is. Head, it just takes the top slice, the head of your data frame, okay? The function str, S-T-R, uh, stands for structure. This is my favorite way to um, actually dig in and look at your data. Um, so if you ran structure df, what you're gonna see is this. It's going to give you so many details. So it tells you, one, your object is a data frame. Two, you have eight observations. So that's eight rows of four variables, four columns. So it's giving you this in a very explicit terms. Then it shows you each of your column names. It's showing you the variable type. So here, my first one is a character string. If we had set as is equals false, when we read in our data, so that's here, when we read in our data, we set as is equals true, okay? That caused this character string to be um, a character string instead of a factor. If we set it to false, then it would have automatically created a factor variable out of this, but we don't wanna use it as that. These are just our, um, let's say they're our participant IDs, for example. We don't really need a grouping variable for that. So we want it to just be kept as a character string. So the structure actually shows us what is a character string versus a factor, which is the variable that we created, which is a factor that has two levels. The base level or the, the level that everything will be compared to is control. And so structure is very important for understanding your factors um, because it can actually um, tell you what's the base level and um, is it even a factor? Because we could have had a column, for example, let's see if we look at it, my DF, I'm just going to do view here of it. This, the way it shows up here, it could also just be character strings. This could not, this could, in fact, not be encoded as a factor and still look like this in this environment. So this structure function tells you how R is actually interpreting your um, variables, okay? Um, one sec, I just want to read in the uh, Slack comments here. Um, yeah, so dim won't give you information for vectors um, because it is one dimensional. Um, yeah, so I love that question, Carmen. Um, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, you, you wouldn't have uh, such a nice plot uh, in general. Um, and so structure is going to give you the first observations. So Carmen, I don't know if you guys saw, Carmen just asked, what if um, for this, um, this graph we created, what if instead of using exposure group, we actually just used exposure, which is a numeric variable. So we can just try that, okay? So let's take exposure group away and see if we didn't have a factor there, we used, um, da -da -da. so what happened was, oops, here we go. So the first problem is fill is looking for a continuous value. So, um, or sorry, fill is looking for a grouping variable here. So it would have been upset by that, okay? So that's what this first error is. So I'm actually just gonna take away this um, aesthetic inside here, okay? Now, let's see. What happens is exposure is now continuous. I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm gonna also change my theme set to classic. Okay. 
Okay. So what happens is instead of groups, which I wanted, I wanted to have two box plots that are groups. I only have one box plot because exposure actually is, um, it's not a category anymore. It is a continuous value that's zero or one in our data, but it could take any value um, really. And that's how R is seeing it, it's seeing it as numeric. And so that's why having the factor is really important. So then here, I'm gonna change it back to group, exposure group, um, and I'm not gonna change the fill. See how that changed? Now I actually have two groupings. So I have two box plots that I wanted to compare. Um, and that's what making that factor, having this um, factor encoded here versus using it as an integer there, um, that's why it's important especially when you graph it, because R is going to be treating it now here as a group versus here as just a continuous number, okay? And even though it says integer here, integers and numbers, like the alternative would be NUM, um, which is just a continuous number, R treats those the same. So either way, it sees numbers, it's gonna treat them as continuous numbers, and that's what was happening before. So. In your plot pane, you can actually use your arrows to go to previous plots you've plotted. So I'm just gonna use this arrow back one and see again, exposure itself is a number. And so you're not able to, um, you're not able to group your values as you would have liked to, even though you know zero is one group and one is another group, R thinks you're just, you just have numbers there. So here is what you need that for. All you always right. have to recode the, them then into a factor, or is there a way, like you said, you import it as is. Could you tell it when you're importing it that something is categorical if you've got them numbered yeah. as like group categories based on numbers, like one, two, three, four kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if they're numbers as is, like there, you will have to tell R explicitly. If they're numbers, R will always treat them as numbers when you read them in. So you will have to create a factor somehow um, explicitly. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yep, strings as factors equals false is the same as as is equals true. So those those two commands, they they speak to each other. Like they, they you can use either. I just like as is equals true because it's short. Um, what if there is here? <laughs> if the original spreadsheet had case and control instead of zero and one, then um, you can, use as is equals false, it will treat them as um, factors and that will be automatic. The problem then that could occur though is you could have case as your baseline and control as your comparator group. So that could be an issue, but it will, it will be a factor and it will plot correctly. Notice that the baseline group is plotted first here um, and the comparator group is plotted second. Um, so if that, again, like if that's a preference of yours, if you, if it matters, which one's the baseline, then, um, you may still have to set it, um, explicitly, um, when you read it in, um, or, or when, after you read it in, uh, set it explicitly in your code. Um, and now, uh, strings as factors equals false is now the default, um, in our versions four on. Thanks, Greg, actually, that's good to know. Um. Another thing though is um, if you don't know what baseline R has set when you read in your data. So let you, let's say you had case and control in your spreadsheet, you read it in, you can use the structure function to tell you which one is your baseline by um, seeing it here. Your first level is going to be printed first control case. Like it's going to be setting them out. So you would know what your um, baseline uh, factor would be. Yeah, integer, it's treated as a continuous variable. So integer versus non-integer, it, it doesn't really make a difference, even though R will specify that it sees an integer here. Yeah, these are all great questions. Okay, so um, here I'd like everyone to go ahead and get the structure output out. Um, just so you guys can see it, get used to it. It's just like a lot of information. And when I first started using R, I found it very like gross and overwhelming, but um, I think it is the most useful kind of output you can get. So just go ahead and click yes, and then we'll move right along once you have that.
All righty, almost there, a couple more. All right, good. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and clear. We're moving on, awesome job. Now, uh, let's access specific elements. So let's update this column's name, right? Like this is so weird looking and like, I don't even actually, <laughs> off the top of my head know how to create this character um, using my keyboard. So it's like a pretty hard one, like a pretty hard uh, column name to actually uh, deal with. So to see the first column name, we're going to think back to when we were dealing with vectors and data frames, okay? So you can use names df to create the vector and this one in brackets is the first element, okay? So this will show you the first column name. To overwrite it, you just add equals and then your new column name here, okay? And so to do this, or once you've done this, go ahead and click yes. And you can run your stir DF again, structure uh, again, and you will see that it is a new um, sample ID here. It'll be a new column name. Uh, that's one way you can look in view. You can click on it. You can use head, um, anything you want. You can use names even, just run this just names DF to see it. Um, but uh, once you've overwritten the first column name, go ahead and click yes. Awesome, great. It looks like a few people have it already. Very good. Great. And if you're running into issues, just screenshot it, share with the class. This is a pretty easy step though. This one should be. Wonderful. Okay. All right, I think that should be almost everyone. Make sure to stop us if you're running into issues at all, okay? Aha, great question, Carmen. Why no comma? Uh, does anyone wanna try to answer that in the Slack? Um, I'll give you guys a minute to try to think of why, why no comma. It's a very, very good question. Yeah, close. It's a vector. So here we can see names of our DF. It's just a vector. So to access an element, we just want a single bracket, right? If it was a list, we'd want the double brackets. But a vector, we just want one bracket. Um, yeah, it's a great question. And the thing is, when you're using the, the data frame brackets, actually, you're not able to access the names part of the data frame at all. So if we look at our DF, when we use the square brackets um, that have, so here, DF, and we say, like, let's say we want the third row and the fit, uh, no, we don't have five columns, the second column, okay, uh, three, two, um, it's counting with ignoring the, the columns and the rows. Uh, or sorry, the column and row names here. So we can't actually access those column and row names using those um, square brackets with the data frame. We have to actually access names and then in that vector um, access that element, okay? Um, so great, great questions. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and clear all here, awesome. 
let's now look at some base star plots. Now that we've done all this ggplot, let's go and look at what R actually just has as like a baseline within R. Because um, you don't always want a publication ready plot. Um, so graphing, yeah, it allows you to assess so many issues with your data and you should do it with ease and often. Um, so these are some, pardon, uh, different plots. So you could have just a histogram of your data. So this is taking in a vector, a plot. You want a scatter plot. So you want to take in two vectors. One is your x-axis, one is your y-axis. Uh, a bar plot, right? You want frequencies by groups. So that's going to take a vector that is the different frequencies of each of your groups, a named vector. Um, a box plot, like we just did, that'll have a formula. We're going to actually look at that. And we're going to compare this box plot to the one we made previously. And then a strip chart is actually pretty cool. It's kind of like um, categorical histograms. So if you have um, multiple different categories and then continuous values and you don't want to use a box plot, you can make a whole histogram using a strip chart and it'll essentially uh, show the density in each of those categories. So let's look at hist though, histogram. All right. So we don't want to forget to specify the data frame of uh, the variable that we're getting. So we want a histogram of their biomarker value. We specify the data frame and here we can use dollar sign um, biomarker value. Similarly though, uh, we could also do hist df and then we know that biomarker value is the third column. So we could say we want all rows of the third column and that also will work, okay? Um, so here's a histogram um, and you should get something like this, okay? Um, so one tip, again, use tab. I'm going to keep saying it. Um, it'll just make your life easy because it's easy to make a, a mistake typing these out. Um, and once you've got your histogram up, go ahead and click yes. Awesome. Great. Wonderful. Okay, so it looks like we're good to go. So you use the dollar sign when you want to access an element that's inside an object. Okay, so that was like kind of a weird way of saying that. Here's how I'll say it again. Um, we want a column inside DF. We want that column biomarker value that's from the DF data frame. So we use the dollar sign to access that column, okay? So more specifically, here's DF. We want to go into this column, and we, this is what we want a histogram of. So we say hist DF, and then we say, okay, I want the biomarker value column. So I just push tab to get all of those options up, and then that's how I got it up there, okay? All right, good. Okay, looks like we got it. So we'll move along. And you know, let, let's say we want to we want to update this histogram. Let's say we're happy with it, but uh, we want to make some alterations to it. So we then can use the same hist function. We have our variable to be graphed. This is from our previous um, our previous time. Now we want the x-axis label. So this is similar to ggplot, but here, instead of adding on geoms, the way it works in base R is it's just additional arguments within the hist function here, okay? Um, and so main is the title of our graph. So we wanna update it to the biomarker distribution. We want the label on our x-axis to be the biomarker and then units. And then we want the color that's filling in our histogram. Here, I'm making it Dodger blue. You can make it any color you want, pink, white, blue, um, black, whatever you'd like. This next line is going to draw a line on top, OK? So ab line, it draws a line on top of an existing graph. And um, here, we want a vertical line, and we want it at 50. Okay, so let's say this is a pretty important value for our biomarker. So we want to specify this on our plot and we want to have a line that's showing, you know, here's the values that are above the distribution of the values above 50. Here's the value or the distribution below 50. And here's that line. 
we want our line to be black and we want it to be thick. So we want it to kind of be bold and show up um, beyond our graph, like um, kind of be market on our graph. And we'd like it to be dashed. So we don't want to just kind of blend in uh, with everything in our graph, okay? So this should give you this graph. And once you guys have this graph, go ahead and click yes. And it doesn't have to be the same colors, play with different line types even, you know, there's different types of dashes uh, beyond two. You could change it to five or three. Um, line widths, make it really, really thick. Uh, try different colors. You can even move this um, around. You'll notice though, as you run ab line again and again, if you change it, it's just gonna keep adding a line. So if you want to make a new graph where you only have one ab line, you've got to make your graph again, which means run your histogram again, and then run your ab line again, because it is literally drawing a line on top um, of your graph here. Okay. And if you run into issues, just screenshot it. We'll all, we'll all go through it together. Ab line, it's just drawing a line on top. So if you run your, if you show your histogram, um, or if you only run this hist, it will just be a histogram. Ab line, it just, it draws the line right on top of your graph. So if you write ab line 30 and you run it again, it'll draw another line down here. So you can have multiple ab lines and they'll just keep drawing line, 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 line. You could add a horizontal line, maybe um, two is a special value uh, for your thing. So you could make it H equals two, and then you'll have another line um, drawn horizontally at the two on the uh, Y axis. So it just, it's just drawing a line. It's very useful though, because um, often you'll want a line somewhere on your graphs. And don't forget to click yes once you've got it. Uh, got it up and going. But feel free to experiment. All right, and we've got a no here too. Um, either uh, Greg or um, Gabby can pull you into, oh, our nose, pull you into a breakout room or feel free to put it on the Slack. All right. Mm -hmm. So it looks like so yeah, uh Ran, it looks like your um you started to write it and it it didn't close out. Aha. Uh -huh. You didn't finish your, um, you didn't close your parentheses on your first hist. So you want to get rid of those pluses. So go ahead and escape your pluses. Um, like I showed before, you know, where it just keeps plussing on down. Um, escape out of that. And then um, just run hist, but make sure you close your parentheses. So have your whole hist command run with your parentheses closed. And then abline is a totally new command that's also self-contained. The R colors are, uh, they're universal. So the colors that I'm, I'm writing in here, you can use them with ggplot, you can use them with just base R, um, they'll always be the same. You can also use um, hexadecimal codes if, you, if you're familiar with them and comfortable with manipulating your colors that way. Um, but yeah, the colors, they're, they're universal here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some have special palettes, that's right. Didn't get the ab line yet. Yeah, so just make sure you get the hist closed and then ab line. 
closed. Let's look. Awesome. So you got your hist, and now your ab line is uh, there's a quote at the very end. So if you see the LTY equals two, there's a quote there. So it's opening up a quote and it's looking for that to get closed. Um, so if you get rid of that quote, I think it should add an ab line, but also make sure to escape out of your plus sign there. Um, because if you keep adding comments on that or, or adding um, commands on that, it's just gonna keep plussing. Wonderful, all right. Looks like we're good to go. Great job, everyone. And I think a useful debugging exercise for everyone. Okay, so now let's look at box plots because we drew a box plot previously. Now we can see how you actually don't need to um, use box plots in the exact same way uh, as we did before. So here I'm showing box plots using base R. I have my biomarker value and I want it split by my exposure. Notice I'm not using my factor value here. Um, again, uh, use tab um, and it, you should be coding really quickly. Um, and once you get a box plot up, go ahead and click yes. And if you get this box plot up, you can start trying things with the colors or um, with the X labels, all of this, everything we did in the previous um, uh, graph with the different commands you can add, you can add those here as well um, because base R um, has all these plotting options and they're universal. So um, if you'd like, you can change colors, uh, access labels, everything um, and experiment with them while, uh, while we're waiting for everyone else to go ahead and get their box plot up. Yeah, so this tilde here is saying split my group and split this into these groups. And so the, significant is, the significance is um, if you don't want groups, you would just not have that. You could just have a box plot of your biomarker values by themselves. Um, the other thing is that's interesting is this is an integer and it is allowing you to use it as like a grouping variable here. So base R is different from ggplot that way. You don't have to have a factor for your box plots. If you have integers, then it's gonna assume their factors essentially for this. Um, so just two things of note here. All right, it looks like we're getting it. Okay, so you should have something like this. So we've got a zero and a one here, right? Which is what our exposure is. Um, but we know it's a case, uh, a control and a case here. Um, so the factors aren't shown, right? Um, it's just all white um, because we haven't just, we just haven't added color. We haven't specified anything, all right? So just like last time, we want to update these axes labels, make them bigger, update the colors, include a legend. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I had more there. Um, so to do that, uh, we actually do it uh, similar to how we did with the histogram. So we've got our box plot function exactly as we did. This is exactly what you just ran, DF biomarker value uh, and then tilde DF dollar sign exposure. You've got your X variable there. Um, if you want, you could change this to exposure group if you would like uh, case and control to be labeled on your axes. Um, you've got your Y axis labels. So you want um, biomarker units. Oops, here we go. Your X axis label is your exposure. And we want the labels to be bigger. Um, so the way we do that is using cex.lab. CEX is a multiplier um, of the, the like text that you're gonna see. So when you do CEX lab, it's saying make it one and a half times larger. This is different from ggplot where we actually set a base point size. 
Um, so it's it's a, a distinction between the two, like base R versus ggplot. And we want our colors by group here. I just set them to the same ones we used before. But again, explore. Feel free to use the ones that you think are best um, and look right to you. OK. Then to add a legend, it's actually a new command. So this runs all on its own, all together. And the legend is layered on top. So it's another thing you add on, similar to the ab line, how it's drawn on top of an existing graph. The legend is going to be drawn on top. If you run this again and again, but you're changing things about it, let's say you're changing the location, it's just going to keep putting new legends on your plot. If you want to add, um, you want to update the legend, you need to make the plot again, and then you need to add the legend um, on there anew. OK, and so within the legend command, we use the legend function. We have our x axis location here, our y axis location here. Experiment with moving it around. You have a lot of um, uh, leeway here to move it to where you'd like it to go. Um, the legend labels. So here I'm going to say control and case. And they're blue and dark orchid, so these have to match in order. OK, so that's what's going to be laying out for you. And the title is exposure. All right. So go ahead and do this. Once you have your graph that has, you know, um, box plot, two box plots, um, and you've got a legend there, go ahead and click yes. Feel free to experiment. Again, you can change this to exposure group if you want, different colors, change the sizes. You can make it two times larger, three times larger if you want. Um, move your legend around if you'd like. Change the uh, legend name. See what that does. Um, so, so really, I encourage you to experiment with it. Try to break it and see if you can fix it again, too. Awesome. Looks like someone got it already. Great. Don't forget to click yes once you have it. Um, and then once you have it, start experimenting. Hmm. Magla, it looks like it's cutting off a bit of it. Um, it may be your legend um, is cutting off a bit of your um, plot. 
um, because that is what it's supposed to look like in principle, but then uh, there's that big cutout part. Yes, Carmen, you could do this using exposure group as well. Yeah. And see how that, give it a try and see how it changes it if you do that. Awesome. And don't forget to click yes once you've got it. Oh, great. Let's see. So, uh, Ran, uh, in Legend, there you're missing a quote after control. So you want to make sure that closes its quotes and then comma and then close quotes around case like you have already is, is good to go. Um, but that's why it's... Uh, it just keep it, it just making it a long quoted string. Yes, the position of the legend is determined by these X and Y values. So you can move them around. So also give that a try. Sorry, I must have missed that. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Um, and if you find it's not fitting, you might get an error that's saying the plot axis uh, figure margins are too small. Just make your plot window bigger. Um, that should fix it. Excellent, we got 10 people. Awesome. Yeah, so um, Dahlia, what you're seeing there is just, um, it's because of the, the plot window is very small. If you make it larger, a lot of that will be fixed. Um, like it'll look a lot nicer. Uh, you may have to rerun it though once you've, um, once you've, um, change the, the plot like window to be larger um, because it will re-render in a way that fits that window better. Um, great question. Um, so is it possible to add an asterisk to show statistical significance on the plot? Yes, um, I need to find it, but essentially I think it's text um, function and um, it's similar to legend. You find a point, like you, you tell it the point on the plot where you want that to write um, and give quotes on it. Um, so that is certainly possible to do. Is there an easier way than trial and error with like the plot posi or the positions yeah. with the X and Y? Um, well, so one thing is um, to actually look, so this is a different plot. I'm just gonna get this plot up. Um, is just to look on the axes um, of where you would actually want it to be. So I'm just going to get this plot up. So here um, it's at 1.8. So this is one, two, uh, no, it's not, that's not right. 94, so it should be the top right, I believe, is where it's putting it. Like, so if you think about this as a square um, and it's placing it there, um, so if I wanted it in maybe the lower, like if I want it down here, I could change this 94 to like, let's change this to like 14. So now this has been moved down. So this is 14. So that's where that point is, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a little bit less trial and error, but honestly, a lot of it is trial and error. Also notice, um, like I said before, it's just writing it on top. So yeah. um, it just added a second one. So you just need to rerun it to have it have only one. Um, so when you're in base R then, as opposed to ggplot, can you put the legend sort of beside the plot or not really? It has to be kind of amongst it has to be it somewhere. Amongst it somewhere. Yeah, okay. unfortunately, I would say that's a, a major uh, detractor of this method. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. How are we doing? 
All right, don't forget to click yes once you've got it. And I'll give everyone two more minutes. And anyone who's um, got it up, just keep experimenting, trying new things, changing the CEX lab, the position, different colors, labels. All right. You don't have to select the whole command and click control enter each time. So you can just, so let's say you've changed it. You can just have your cursor at the top here, like just anywhere um, and just run it again that way. See, so I just have my cursor anywhere, control enter, it ran again. You can tell because it erased the legend and now just control enter, run again. Okay. All righty. Did so, that run your entire script again? Sorry. Yeah, or great just... question. Yeah, no, it just ran the one command. Okay. So here I run this. It just ran that. And the way I know that is because down here, um, I can see what was run. So I'll just be like, I'm, I'm just going to write a comment here. Um, comments, you can tell because they have little hash symbols in front of them. So this is a comment. So then I have that comment there and then I'll just run this again. It just ran the one command with the comment above it here. Interesting that it automatically ran that comment above, um, but it didn't run the rest. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for asking. Really good questions, you guys. It didn't run the legend exactly. It just ran the one command. And then if I wanna run the next command, I have to specify, like I have to do that now. So I do control enter and now it ran that one. So it, see, it's just hopping one command each time. It will only run one little piece of the code. Um, and that piece is self-contained by these um, uh, parentheses around it. So that piece is all that will be run with that control enter. Makes sense, thanks. Awesome, okay. All right, so We've got the shape and location of this. Uh, it changes with your plot window, as you've all probably noticed. Um, so the plot window is very important. You know, it is also important for ggplot, a little bit less so, as you can see here, um, it is extremely important. In some cases, it may be that the plot window is so small, part of your graph got completely covered by the legend, even being in this location. Um, so yeah, so you can try out different locations. Unfortunately, a lot of it becomes trial and error. Um, and then the CEX, it changed the, the sides of uh, these axes as well here, okay? So now you guys are gonna practice on your own. So you're basically gonna do what we did this morning um, in your own code. So um, on the course website, there's assignment data one, it's a CSV file. Um, you're gonna set your working directory. So you're gonna download that data, set your working directory, read in your data, inspect the data frame, create a responder factor um, that is two levels, zero and one. The uh, baseline is a non-responder and the um, comparator group is a responder. So you wanna know the difference between the responders and non-responders to some treatment. And then you're, cre you're gonna create a box plot of your biomarker relative to your response. And you can do that using BASAR or you can use it doing ggplot, using the ggplot um, functions, okay? Um,